isolated dynamics. So when these nodes are uncoupled to the graph, they are isolated, the, their dynamics, so taking iterations of this map F, uh, will be given by this small F. But since they are interacting to each other, they will interact in terms of this uh, function H that will denote the pairwise interaction. So you may see this in nature in many regions, pairwise interaction among units and bodies. And in the overall, they are coupled interacting via this graph structure that can be complicated. For example, this one that I'm showing you, it can be quite general. You may have undirected links. So both nodes are coupled and field interaction among them, or you may have only one direction coupling. So this node receives the influence of this node, but not the vice versa. If I write this down in terms of a dynamical system perspective, I have this map. So I'm taking, and I will call it this network dynamics capital F, where is given by for each coordinate of this graph of this map, I will have what I mean by isolated dynamics plus the coupling uh, term. So if alpha is zero, they will only evolve independently to each other. But if I turn on this alpha, there will field interaction among the others, where this AIJ denotes a adjacency matrix is called. So when I and J are coupled, this will, this will give you one. And if they're not coupled, zero. Great. So this could be applied as well to ordinary differential equations and where this F will be replaced by a vector field in, on a given manifold. And you still have this splitting, isolated plus interaction. This might be may be seen in a diverse of systems. I will give you only the examples, uh, two examples. So the first one is power systems. So you do have this complicated power grid with some generation of energy, which they need to distribute and transmit up to consumers. And in this kind of systems, it's understood that you do have a, a modeling, which is given by network dynamics, as I just described to you. So on each node of this, either being a generator, generator or a consumer, this isolated dynamics will be periodic. Uh, how they are coupled to each other will be diffusive. So it will depend on the phase difference of, of of who they are connected to. So this age will be a function which depends on phase difference of the states. And the graph structure is highly complicated. So you even can see in the street, at least in Brazil, it's a highly non-trivial uh, and complicated network which connects uh, these uh, generators and consumers along the whole area of Brazil. So in this kind of systems, it's quite interesting to understand, for example, uh, when they when they are synchronized, so there is state is a really important the frequency of these generators. So here the standard is sixty hertz. So you may model the system when uh, they are synchronized in sixty hertz, and then the whole system behaves correctly. But as soon as this can be disturbed. You may do something in your, locally in your home or it might happen in, into the generator, some balance of energy, and you may have some stability problems. And the whole point will be to understand how stable is this kind of system. Knowing this F, H and H and G might help you to understand this. Other system that I can think of is neural node networks. So given some level of description of a neuronal system, you may have this level of in a hierarchy, which will denote when neurons can see each other and they are interacting. In the system as well, you may define how they are isolated, how they behave isolated. You may find periodic motions or chaotic, which I don't want to be precise here what I mean by chaotic, but I want to, to say that this will be the main focus throughout my whole presentation today. This H, the coupling, you can now do the electrical coupling or a chemical coupling. And also G is highly non-trivial, okay? In this system, you might be interested 
for example, when the network becomes synchronous as well. So you may have a oscillatory uh, or synchronous activities of these neurons, and these produces undesired effects such as epilepsy seizures. So it's known that epilepsy seizures is a synchronous motions of parts of your brain. If you understand this F, H, and G, it could have a, a hope to understand and to predict when some epilepsy seizure will occur. Given this, uh, these two systems are, they share one aspect at least, which is you cannot perform experiments in the brain or in the entire power system. You may simulate it in your computer, but you cannot do and perform a experiment. But what you can do, you can observe responses to some input and measure it. And that's how it comes to play the reconstruction problem that I want to say. So imagine you have this network dynamics, which can be highly complicated, but you measure something. Here, I would denote by, I would denote precisely that I will measure the trajectories of each node. But this is not necessarily true. You could only observe another observable from the system. And the hope or the, the main objective would be to reconstruct the network dynamics, F, H, and G, in such a way that you can, for example, gain control and prediction capabilities. In this example that I just told you, you could get stability control of power systems or even predict uh, epilepsy seizures in, in some patients. So just to give you a uh, notification, a couple weeks ago, I found this. There's a context up to February 2023 where uh, there's an, this institution, Epilepsy Foundation, they pay up to $8,000 uh, to people that can model and can construct a good algorithm to identify epilepsy seizures for patients which wear some watches. So this is indeed a current uh, and intense research area up to now. My perspective is that understanding these network dynamics from what you can measure may help us to understand and, and to gain these two aspects that I just showed you. But indeed, we do have a problem. For this system, so if you talk to experimentalists, they they claim the following they claim that depending on the system that you have you may be limited by the time resolution or the cost to acquire data so sometimes you're in terms of in a long time these trajectories these observables that you receive from the system they are limited in time if you compare with the whole system size so you sometimes you have hundreds uh, or thousands of nodes and you always you only can receive a short uh, time series. So that's what I'm, I'm mostly interested in from now on, which is you have limited amount of data, meaning not long time series, and as opposed to how large can be the system. So from now on, I will define the proper problem that I'm interested in. So what I will do, I will simplify the problem I will take this graph, I will receive trajectories. So indeed the trajectories of, uh, of the system. So I will measure every single node in my system, which is already quite unrealistic for many systems. And this N, hopefully you can see there's a small N here, say how long you measured it. And I will say that this measure, this number of measurements is small in comparison to the size of the system. My hope is to run some machinery to give back some graph structure. I'm not running now for this talk to get F and H, but only to return to obtain the graph structure. Okay. So my main problem will be to determine how how large can be this time series, which is small n, the length of the time series, such that I will be able to recover the graph structure that produced the data from a system that I didn't know a priori. Is that okay? Is that clear the problem? Or oh, I think that here is a really good point to open for questions or comments.
Okay, if that's not the case, I will, I'm, I'm claiming that uh, today I will show you some dynamical system theory that could apply to solve this reconstruction problem. Okay, so I will go for the second word that was in my title, which is sparse networks. Uh, in reality, networks are sparse. In particular, these two examples that I just showed you, they are sparse. I don't want to be really precise what I mean by sparse, but sparse will be that given one node of your network, not, a, not all connections are realized in this network, okay? So only a few connections are possible. And another assumption that I do have in my system is if you have F and H, so this isolated map and the coupling function, they will be span by some linear combination of, uh, of base functions that someone, some experimentalists gives you, okay? So just to, to be more concrete, I mean, each coordinates of the node dynamics, which is this coordinate of this map that I, I was telling you about in natural dynamics, should be given by a linear combination of these base functions that this experimentalist gave you. And uh, here is to emphasize this M. So the number of base functions will be large, as large as your network. And what I mean by sparsity here or a sparse representation of this node dynamics will mean that these CIs here, L, these coefficients, they yield a coefficient in this RM space and they will be sparse meaning many entries will be zero. So I can be more concrete. So this support of CI, you calculate the cardinality. This will mean the non zero elements of this vector CI, coefficient vector CI, they will be less than M, much less than M, which is the large number of base functions that you have in your, in your library in your set of, set of base functions. And I would simply say that indeed, given the network is sparse, this gives you an intuition that indeed, if you assume this, the sparsity level or the non-zero elements of this coefficient should be related to the, non, to the number of connections one given node has. This number of connection of a given node, I would denote by Ki, it's degree, it's called in graph theory. Since this is a quite core thing uh, in my, my presentation, I will give an example, okay? So here's this uh, sparse uh, network dynamics, okay, that I introduced before. And for the isolated part, I've introduced this map, which is really and highly standard in dynamical systems. So it's fxi will give by r, which is a parameter and a quadratic polynomial, okay? This r should be lying inside this interval and I will say why in a moment. If you see the graph of this function in the interval, this is precisely uh, the, the graph for when r equals four precisely. And you may see that it maps the interval zero one to the interval zero one. So you indeed have the have a, a, net, a, a map, a dynamical systems. If you see the trajectory, so if you take iterations of this map uh, for a given point, this will be uh, the trajectory. So when I meant before for the neuronal dynamics, chaotic, now I can be more illustrative. What I mean by chaotic, I mean trajectories, which will mean like this. So a long time here in the X axis, and the vertical axis, you have the, the state that we're measuring, and you may see that it's quite chaotic. You cannot even predict by naked eye what's going on. By the way, I removed these uh, pictures from that book, which is amazing book. So if you have any uh, interest in dynamical systems with uh, statistics, this book, it's amazing. It's, anyway, so this was the, isolated part. So I will give you as well the definitions of the uh, JCC matrix and the coupling. For, for this example, I will say that the coupling will be X squared, okay? And the JCC matrix will be 
that's related to this graph that I'm denoting here. So you have a, a small network, but it is sparse. Since three, for example, is not connected to all nodes, but only for three nodes out of four possible, and, and so on and so forth. I highlighted this node two just to give you a description of what will be this node dynamics, for example. And that's how, how we re read it. So you have the isolated part, which I replaced by X2, plus the coupling with the node one. Okay. Since I mentioned these network dynamics should be spread over a given set of base functions, this is what I have. So the base functions, which are natural, will be polynomials. Okay. So the experimenter should give me, give me oh, you see, you can represent these network dynamics using polynomials up to degree two. Okay. Uh, I can rewrite it, uh, the equation. So given the node dynamics that I was trying to, uh, to tell you about in the next time iterate should be equal to a linear combination of the base functions, okay? I can rewrite this sum with respect to a linear inner product of two vectors, which is quite simple. Either you have a vector which evaluates these base functions along the trajectory that you have times the coefficient that you want to determine. That, that is here, okay, these coefficients. If you do this step by step along the data that you have, that kind of matrix that you will uh, construct in the left side, you have for each iterate, you construct what you measure in the next iterate. And this should be related to a matrix which evaluates along the trajectory that you receive times the coefficient. And here I wanted this example precisely because I took C2. So C2 was only connected to node one. So you may see that there are a lot of zeros such that you can recover what I described here. So you have a lot of zeros out of all possibles and R, alpha and R will be the non-zero terms. You can repeat this process for all nodes in, your, in the system that I just made up. And this will be how it looks like. So you have the coefficients here. Each line will correspond to which entry corresponds to the given base functions. All entries will be zero, apart from this one that are highlighted in circles. When I said uh, that the sparse of the network implies that these, uh, these vectors will be sparse as well, you may see that since the connection will be given by the quadratic terms, you can see precisely here. So node one will be coupled to node two and node three. So one node two and three, node two will be coupled to node one and so on and so forth. Uh, I think here as well, it's a really good moment. Is there clear the, the example? I, I think okay. so. Please, if there are any questions. Okay, so that's what I mean, sparse network and sparse representation of a given uh, set of base functions. And now I will tell you how I will reconstruct because up to now I've been blah, 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 right? So I need to give some way to, to resolve, to solve this uh, inverse problem. Okay, the way I constructed, I just told you about, I gave you a, a way which I have the data that I received and I requested as a system of equation or as a linear equation. In the left side, you have a vector. In here, you have a matrix, which by the way, I divided here by one square root of N just, just because it will be nice in, later on times this vector. So in the end, what we realized is that if I want to understand who is connected to whom? I could look at simply this coefficient, uh, coefficient vector here, this coefficient entries. So I will be able to determine who is connected to whom. And I found that a linear equation which uh, solves this. In the left side, you have the data. So you have this. This matrix here, you do have as well. So you have the trajectories, you have the base functions. So you have this matrix. The only thing that a priori you don't know, but you know exists, is the CI. 
So I think it's clear, at least from now on, that if I want to understand CI, I will need to solve this linear equation. Okay, quite close. And now I'm in mean, anyway. We that's what we want to do. Okay. To solve this problem, we have uh, many options actually, and I will define only two. The first option that definitely you heard about it, it concerns of the following situation. N, small n, is the how large is the time series. Remember, I was caring about this, this balance of how large is the time series against how large is the base functions, the number of coefficients you need, you need to determine. If n, the, the length of the time series, is much larger than the number of base functions, you can solve using a least square, which will give you the best approximate in this norm. But that's not the case that we are having. We have a distant case, which is the number of measurements in time doesn't fill uh, the number of base functions that you have because we have large networks. So indeed, we are in the regime of short time series, limited amount of data. So the picture will be like this. You have a small vector here equals a large matrix, which is highly fat, times the coefficient that you want to determine. So since it's, it's a fat matrix, this is undetermined. So given there exists one solution, this system has infinite many of solutions. So in terms of these situations, apparently, the reconstruction will fail miserably because you cannot solve this inverse problem. However, that's why I introduced the notion of sparsity networks, which is we know that we are interested about sparse networks. So these CIs, they have a particular structure, which is mm -hmm. many entries are zero. Only a few of them are non-zero. So this gives the intuition or give an additional structure to the problem. And we can use this to solve this reconstruction problem, okay? So that's what, uh, that's what people have mostly focused uh, and, and, and introduced in early 2000s, which is a new minimization problem, okay? Which gives as follows. For each i, which is i is the node of your network, right? For each i, it will solve this minimization problem. You minimize L1, given the constraint that you need to fit the data that you have. So it should satisfy this equality. Looking at, at like this, it doesn't seem like a, a straightforward to see why this should care and why this should give you a sparse solutions, so solutions which have many zeros, but I will try to give an illustration. So in 2D, this may be misleading, but I think it's good for the intuition. In, in 2D, you have the space, you have C, which is the solution that you want. So it's a vector in R2. And uh, we know that the C is, is sparse. So there are many zeros. This means that in R2, the C definitely will lie in one of the axes, right? Because so one of the answers will be zero. This constraint here will be lie and give you a a whole line, a plan, if you want to understand the high dimension. Say all vectors which satisfy the constraints you want, and definitely C will lie in this. What we will be doing is we will minimize L1 balls such that you will match this vector that you want to address precisely in this intersection. So that's why this, intuitively at least, these minimization problems, you will give you some vector which is, which is sparse, which is the one that we know, uh, that we want, okay? And that will be the procedure that we will be studying from now on. This is called basis pursuit. And basis pursuit, because you are trying to fit a basis that you know is partially represented uh, in this base. Okay, is that uh, clear? Or is there any comments? I think that's a really good point to ask. Anyway, okay. So I will show you a table. I just gave you the spoiler, which determines uh, a picture. So 
the one that we know how to solve a priori is when n, the length of time series is much larger than the number of no unknowns that you have. And we know a condition on this matrix that I introduced, which determines a uniqueness of solutions. So if this matrix is full rank, you will understand that this uh, the solving L2 norm, minimizing L2 norm, will give you a unique solution. So this would be good for you because then uh, you will be able to recover what produced the data that we received. But not. But now in the L1 case, we have two unknowns now, which is how large should be the time series, which I will be noted by N0, okay? Because I'm, I'm caring about the term in this length, which will be less than M, such that we need to fill this gap about some condition which will determine uh, the uniqueness of solution. So we'll be able to use as well this minimization in a different norm as a recover method. Okay, and that's why that's what I want to address now. It to determine this n zero. Okay, and here it becomes the most technical part of my talk. So please stop whenever you want. From now on, I will search for a unique S sparse solution via this method that I'm talking about. So I will determine the level of sparsity. So how many non-zero elements I will be searching, and this non-zero element will be determined by S, which is a parameter, which will be calculating oh, how many non-zero elements of the solutions you are trying to search. And a couple of years ago, there was some seminal paper which these authors could determine a condition on the matrix phi as such which would determine the uniqueness of S sparse solutions now. So the condition goes as follows. If you can determine that given the S target, if two S columns of this library matrix are nearly orthonormal, okay, then the base pursuit will be unique, uh, have a unique solution. So here, uh, nearly orthonormal, it's not precise enough, so I can give a formula what we need to calculate, and the calculation is precisely this. You need to maximize over all sets over cardinality up to M, okay, of cardinality, sorry, 2S, and you will construct matrices, sub-matrices from this, this one that you have, which will take subsets of columns, you multiply them doing the inner product of columns minus the identity, and you want that maximizing over all possible assets, you will get a number, which will be, will be called restricted isometry constant, this number here, just to give you a, a definition. And from their theorem, they claim that this guy should be less or equal to a number, such that if this is satisfied, we are in good shape. So now we fill that gap in the table. So we have a condition that we are addressing uh, here. So from now on, I will uh, denote this by restrict isometry property if a matrix satisfies this, okay? So the question be uh, becomes how long is the time series such that this matrix that I'm talking about all the time satisfy this condition that I just described. So we moved from a really ill-posed problem to a mathematical problem where we have hope to solve. Uh, the key idea of everything that I will talk about from now is the following. The idea is that we will change the basis because we have some, some freedom here. This L0 was given to, from someone, from experimentalists. So we do a trick in this base. We change a bit the basis, introduce a new basis where the associated uh, matrix with respect to this new base satisfies the condition that we want. So it's a perfect word. We, we can trick our problem to solve what we need. Great. And now here come some statistical properties of, uh, the, of, under, of the underlying 
uh, of underlying dynamical system. So one assumption that we do need is ergodicity. So that's the most uh, precise that I will be here then. What I mean by chaotic, I will mean a system which is ergodic. So for those that don't know what is ergodic, uh, ergodic you have a map or a network dynamics and a probability distribution associated to this, which is invariant under this, under this, uh, under this dynamics. And to uh, understand this uh, probability distribution, let me give an example. Let's return to our favorite example, which is F goes four X times one minus X. If you take the trajectory of the system for a given initial condition X zero, this is shown in this book. That's what it looks like. So if you take a long enough trajectory, you see that in the phase space, so think this as the interval zero one, in the phase space, the trajectories will be filling up this histogram here with this shape. And if you take larger and larger trajectories, that's what it will look like in the solid line, a solid line. So meaning that this probability distribution for this system has density precisely as this function. And once the system has this, uh, this probability distribution, it's invariant under the dynamics. So ergodistic will come to play in terms of if you need to make some averages over time, you can replace it by averages over this probability distribution. Great. So we were going to use this to do the following trick. What we want is we can we want to take the matrix and take sets of matrix, a set of columns of this matrix and control how independent they are. So what the trick we use here is we will take the Euclidean now inner product that we know from RM and replace it by inner product in this space of square integrable functions in this mu, in the probability distribution that we know that is invariant under the dynamics. So to be quite explicit, what I mean is if you take the inner product of two columns of this matrix, it will look like this, this quantity, one over n and one over n because you remember, I had square root of n, square root of n, so it will be one over n, an average in time of these two observables. But I, what I just described you, ergodicity, will give you the following. This inner product will be approximated by this average in time, in, in space, by these two observables uh, times this probability distribution, okay? And what it will be the perfect world? will be that you want that these vectors should be linear independent. So what is best then uh, almost orthogonal? So almost orthogonal will be that if you take two distinct i and j, you could try to cook up an example where this quantity is zero. And this is precisely when you can orthonormalize these base functions with respect to this probability distribution that comes from the system. And here comes this new basis that I was talking about, which is this new base will be given by orthonormal functions with respect to probability distribution, which we can construct via Gram-Schmidt process, which is something that uh, it's widely used in many aspects in physics and mathematics. This is highly important. So we can use this to use, uh, to introduce this new basis. And the hope is that the matrix in this new basis, which are orthonormal now, satisfies the condition that we wanted. Okay, so I will be now just precise, just because I want to be cool, which is to be really precise and solve the problem, we need two assumptions. The first assumption is what's called exponential mixing, which can be understood by, you have a chaotic systems, okay? So you, if you take one, one trajectory. Intuitively, you can think that this trajectory will visit the whole phase space. But additionally, if you measure the correlation, this will decay exponentially fast with a given rate uh, gamma. This assumption is really helpful to 
really solve what I was trying to sell it here, which is to estimate how long should it be the time series, because you will need to to weight the exponential the, to the correlations to decay up to some 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 time, and then you can measure this time. And finally, it gives why I mean weakly coupled. And that's what I, I will say. So I will consider the regime of weak coupling. Uh, so alpha should be small if we compare to the isolated dynamics. And this is useful because changing bases from you have L0, I mentioned I needed a sparse representation in this L0. When I move to a new one, not necessarily in these new bases, my network dynamics will be sparse. Remember, Grand Schmidt is given by a recursive method. So you need to project over the preceding uh, functions. So if it becomes non zero, non zero, these projections, you start accumulating. And in these new bases, you will not have any more sparse representation. So we could find uh, a regime of weak coupling where this uh, sparsity is preserved, even in the new basis. And more precisely, weak coupling could be understood by the fact that new is a product. So you could see that these, you can treat this system as almost they are independent to each other. Okay. And since alpha is small, this uh, probability distribution will approximate really well the one that you have indeed in the system. So here we are, anyway, I can really be precise here, but uh, I think that's uh, the intuitive idea. So instead of taking base function with respect to mu, I would take base function with respect to uh, nu. That's why I denote, and I will denote by L nu. To summarize everything and put in a given slide, I will uh, state a theorem goes as follows just quickly. So F has a S prime is cross representation in some basis. How I did it for polynomial, which I, we, I can prove that is true. F mu will be weakly coupled, okay, and satisfy the condition that I was telling you about. So what we're gonna do, we construct this set of orthonormal functions with respect to this new, which is a product. So seeing the system as independent to each other. Such that what we hold, it holds the following, the map, which takes these two distinct polynomial bases, the one that you have to this new one, will preserve sparsity and this is good. So now S prime will be met to a S sparse representation. And also I can solve the problem that I was talking about. So for su sufficient large network sizes, I can determine the length of the time series such that the matrix in this new basis satisfy the condition that I was talking about. Delta two, two S to be less than square root of two minus one. Here, if you see this N uh, in the, if you see this N, you see that this n uh, depends on s and depends on n. Because I'm almost a run out of time, I believe what is best to, to, tech, to, to tell you about is that we found a way. So forget about this one, but we found a way that I will call it from now on ergodic basis pursuit, which you can minimize at one with respect uh, to this constraint, this new matrix that I introduced. And I claim that this has unique solution. I will just give you a numerical experiment. I will finish. Sorry, there's someone calling me. Uh, so I will give you one example and I finish. And the example that I think is really nice is goes as follows. You have this network dynamics, which goes, you have this graph, which I will call it a directed core which drives two other nodes, okay? In F, I will put my favorite map, which is this logistic map that I was always talking about. And H will be this coupling, X cubed times Y. And this uh, alpha, the coupling strength will be 0 0.01, quite small. And uh, I will solve this minimization problem. 
given the fact that the phi zero will be polynomials up to the degree four in this case. Just to give you some data, the n, the length of time series will be 175 in comparison to the number of base functions, which is almost 1800. So you do have a really fat matrix. If you solve this problem numerically, that's what you obtain. So even though you had these two nodes, for example, they are having a driving system, when you constructed this uh, front data numerically, the yellow uh, connections are the false positives. So it shouldn't supposed to be there, but they are. And the gray ones are the correct ones. So the reconstruction is busted. Since uh, I was introducing the ergodic base per shoot, I mean, uh, what we can do, we can replace it, this set of base functions with one which is orthonormal now, this new one that I was talking about. And if you replace and redo the same experiment, that's what you'll be taking. So the ergodic base per shoot, there's there are no yellow connections, meaning you, you could perfectly reconstruct uh, the network from the trajectories that you receive from the system. To finish up, I will just tell you that we could do the same thing for experimental data, which I've got really exciting. For ordinary differential equations, we could determine N0, but indeed there are some limitations, which are L0 should be given. So the experimentalist should really uh, guide you about this. And you may have additional costs to autonormalize auto this new in this initial basis. With this, thank you so much. And I'm really happy to take questions. Thank you, Edmondson. Let me stop the recording.